Cool, thanks. Uh, so uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Andrea and uh, to uh, present uh, his work today. So Andrea is a PhD candidate in the Institute for Computational and Mathematical Engineering at Stanford, uh, working with Emma Bernskew. Um, and his research focused on provably efficient methods for RL. Uh, and in particular, he, de he develops algorithms that are capable of auto autonomous uh, exploration. Um, he is, um, and he has also, uh, you know, done many great works uh, in this area and uh, were uh, having uh, worked in uh, internship positions in uh, Facebook AI research as well as Microsoft research. So welcome Andrea and uh, uh, without further ado, uh, please take over and uh, tell us about what you, the, the exponential lower bounds for SRL. Thank you Nan for the introduction. Um, as you mentioned, this work uh, is about uh, battery reinforcement learning. In particular, we are going to see exponential lower bounds for battery L, and we are going to see that there is uh, an exponential separation between battery reinforcement learning and online reinforcement learning. Okay, first of all, what is battery L and why do people use it? Well, um, you're certainly familiar with uh, uh, online reinforcement learning and BatchRL, uh, at least the frameworks. In online reinforcement learning, there is an agent that is interacting with, the, with an environment, and the environment gives back uh, uh, successful states and rewards. Whereas in batch reinforcement learning, we assume uh, uh, this uh, interaction has already occurred, and uh, what's available is uh, a data set of uh, state action, reward, and successful states. And then there is a batch algorithm that is using those uh, offline data to make some prediction, for example, to find a good policy or to predict the value of another policy, uh, which is normally different from the one that generated the data set. Recently, there has been uh, increasing interest, I would say, in the area of batch RL. A lot of it is due to big data. And some of the other reasons are because uh, uh, really exploration can be expensive. Um, often there is a preference for having a safe controller that is uh, uh, collecting the data set, which may be uh, the company's policy, right? And also there is often some uh, engineering overhead that is associated with uh, uh, creating online reinforcement learning solutions. The goal of this work then is to understand uh, what are the fundamental limits of batch reinforcement learning, both in absolute term, um, and that's the exponential lower bound part, and in relative terms uh, with respect to online uh, uh, reinforcement learning. The roadmap is this. We are going to introduce the setting uh, very quickly. The setting is a bit different from uh, uh, maybe other batch reinforcement learning works. And uh, we are going to use this setting to show some uh, fundamental limits of uh, batch reinforcement learning and also we are going to take a look um, at what is causing uh, some of the hardness uh, in uh, batch reinforcement learning, in particular, the bootstrapping issue or the deadly trial. Okay, so setting. Setting is uh, uh, really, there are two fundamental batch reinforcement learning problem. One is the off policy evaluation and the other is the best policy identification. In off policy evaluation, the agent is normally given a data set of data that have been collected by some procedure. And uh, it is also given a target policy. And then the batch algorithm using this data set is required to make a prediction normally about the value of this target policy. If you're trying to do optimization though, uh, you are going to use this batch data set and you are trying to identify a policy that is near optimal. Those are the building blocks. Of course, you can ask uh, uh, more complicated questions. For example, you might want uh, the best policy, but subject to some uh, uh, safety constraint. Uh, you may want that the, uh, the, the policy that you return is strictly better than the current one. But really, those are the two uh, main tasks uh, of uh, batch reinforcement learning. And as the um, state and action space is often very, very, very large, we'll look at the function approximation setting where uh, you assume you have a good predictor for 
the problem that you're trying to solve. So enough policy evaluation, we look at the easiest possible setting where your action value function is uh, uh, captured by a linear map um, that is uh, expressible as an inner product of uh, some feature map. And the feature map is known, is designed by the engineer. And some unknown parameter that depends on the policy. And the agent is trying to uh, understand what this parameter is. Likewise, for best policy identification, the representation condition applies to the optimal value function, that is the, the value function, the action value function of the optimal policy. Uh, I think having uh, a good representation is uh, uh, crucial, and this is no different from, uh, uh, for example, uh, supervised learning. But in reinforcement learning, there are, um, you know, two additional issues. Uh, I mean, those are really also in supervised learning, but they are really in the, the fundamental um, issues that you have to deal with uh, if you do batch reinforcement learning. One is the quantity of the data. Uh, I think this is self-explanatory. The more you have, the better, right? The more samples you have, the better. But then also quality is super important. So for example, uh, your data set is normally uh, collected using some distribution. And if this distribution, for example, has no uh, overlap with the policy that you're trying to estimate, uh, or for example, the target policy, then there is little hope uh, uh, that you can uh, predict the value of the target policy or you know, find the optimal policy if you're really not covering uh, this optimal policy. So really, you need some uh, uh, measure for quality, which is often encoded in uh, um, a concept that people call coverage, uh, how much overlap there is between the state and action uh, of the behavioral and target policy, but it can be captured by other things uh, uh, like, uh, I don't know, covariance matrix, uh, uh, the condition number, or, you know, other concepts that you might have in mind. In this work, uh, we want to uh, bypass those issues. So we want to say, okay, assuming that you have the most favorable condition. So assuming you have no um, misspecification in your predictor and that you have a very large quantity of data and you have the best possible quality, what can we do with batch reinforcement learning, like with an entirely offline approach? To do this, uh, we place very strong assumptions. The first one is uh, um, realizability. So we assume uh, the function class uh, can correctly represent uh, the target policy or the action value function of the optimal policy if you're doing best policy identification. We are assuming that uh, uh, you have no shortage of data. So for any state in action, this is really strong, for any state in action, uh, we assume uh, that uh, you observe uh, the full reward and transition function at those uh, query points. This is a lot of data. Like at every state in action, you don't have a, a noisy observation, but you really have, a, you have almost the Bellman operator. You're essentially a Bellman operator, like the full reward and transition function. This fixes quantity, but also we need quality. Quality is a bit harder to uh, uh, describe. Uh, so what we do is this, uh, we create a framework where there is an oracle, and I'm going to explain this in more detail, detail in the next slide. There is an oracle, and the oracle is trying to um, figure out a way to give a good data set to the batch algorithm. Given a function class, uh, the oracle will try to uh, do whatever it can such that uh, uh, the batch algorithm receives the best data set possible. Okay, in more detail, this is what's happening. There are three ingredients. Um, one is the oracle. One is the environment, and the third one is the batch algorithm. Typically in batch RL, you have the last two, so the environment and the batch algorithm. Here we want to see what's the best thing you can do with batch RL. And so there is an oracle. The purpose of the oracle is to help the batch algorithm by prescribing a good sampling distribution. In particular, the oracle has access to an MDP class. The oracle can inspect every MDP class, uh, sorry, every MDP from the MDP class uh, 
that the batch algorithm is going to interact with. And what does the Oracle do? Well, it chooses uh, essentially the features where you want to observe a reward in transitions. In particular, it chooses the state and action pairs uh, um, in, uh, you know, uh, that are going to uh, generate reward and transitions. Uh, I want to say those MDPs, uh, they all share the same uh, state and action space and, and discount factor and also, you know, feature extractor the, is all the same. Then uh, the environment is going to select uh, uh, an MDP that the batch algorithm is going to interact with and the MDP will have some associated uh, uh, rewards and transition functions. And then the batch algorithm later observes a data set of state and action, reward and transition functions at the state and action chosen by the Oracle. So to recap, Oracle, uh, uh, it doesn't know the actual MDP, but it knows the family class. It prescribes uh, um, state and action where to observe transitions. And then the MDP is going to pick uh, those reward and transitions by picking the MDP. If you want to be more uh, specific, the form of the lower bound, we are, we're heading towards the lower bound here, uh, and the form of the lower bound is uh, uh, like the usual minimax one. Uh, the oracle is, uh, so first of all, the quantity of interest is the number of samples to find, uh, for example, a good policy or to make a good prediction about a target policy up to some accuracy and with some failure probability. And what you want to do is to minimize this number of samples, right? And so the Oracle is working towards minimizing this uh, uh, query complexity, this number of queries, right? And it does that by selecting those state and actions. The environment is the adversary and it chooses a hard MDP from the class. And then if you want, you can introduce another uh, another mean, which would be minimum between, uh, uh, you know, all possible estimators for the batch algorithm if you're trying to do off policy predictions or, you know, minimum over um, all possible policies that you want to return uh, if you're doing best policy identification. Before I move forward, um, is there any question on, on the framework? So I have a couple of questions, uh, Andrea. Yes. So, mm -hmm. so does does I'm, I have questions mostly about the batch algorithm. So, does the batch algorithm know the model class, for example? Like, what is the, what is the batch algorithm know on top of the data set that it receives, or what restrictions do you make about the batch? So, algorithm? okay. So, let's say the batch algorithm knows as much as the oracle. So, it knows uh, uh, the MDP class. So, it knows uh, you know every MDP that is in the class. Eh? It just doesn't mm -hmm. know which MDP generates the data set. So, for example, it does no reliability, right? Because uh, uh, it can examine every MDP in the class uh, and it can, uh, for example, compute the optimal uh, action value function and even the optimal policy for every MDP in the class uh, and it's gonna <laughs> figure out that it is linear, right? So it knows, it knows everything about uh, uh, the MDP class. Mm -hmm. In particular, this Oracle and batch algorithm, you can consider them as a single algorithm if you want. The Oracle um, has full knowledge of the batch algorithm and vice versa. The Oracle is trying to help the batch algorithm. Uh, you may say, what if it doesn't help it? Uh, so, like, really, here we are considering all possible combination of Oracles with all possible combination of batch algorithms. And if no one is able to solve a problem, Really, this means that the best oracle and the best batch algorithm working in concert are not able to, to solve the problem. OK, well, I guess, I guess you're going to say something eventually about what this allows us to conclude about yes, the performance yes. of batch algorithms. I guess you're going to get to that. Definitely, definitely. But, but really, the point here is uh, to avoid uh, um, defining a data, like to avoid defining, defining a, a metric for how good a data set is. because the lower bound that we are going to obtain mm -hmm. is, is pre pretty strong because it says for any batch distribution that the Oracle can select, there is an MDP uh, where things go really, really mm -hmm. badly. Right. So, okay. uh, yeah. uh, Andrew, there's a question I think Chaba had in the chat is, uh, what is the relationship between the small n and the query set part versus the 
calligraphic uh, and later on, like, are they the same thing? Oh, yeah, yeah, no, you're right. You, they are definitely the same thing, yes. Okay, definitely. so I, I guess another way to put it is that maybe you can just write main over like distribution over state action pairs, uh, yeah, yeah, maps, yeah. something sure, like that, sure, right? Sure. That, sure, that will sure, get sure. rid of the redundancy. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. You're, you're definitely right. This is a bit okay. uh, uh, imprecise as definition, yeah. Um, hi, Andrew. I also have a one question. Um, by the MDP family, uh, I mean, like, for example, in the linear class, do, does the Oracle knows the feature map? Yes. It Absolutely. Does. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and the feature map is the same for the old class. So all these MDPs, they share the same state and action space. And in every state and action space, the feature extractor is going to be identical. And the, 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 the Oracle, uh, uh, you know, fully knows that. So you could replace this instruction to, uh, like, with the uh, you know the oracle chooses um, the the feature vector where you want to observe a, a reward and successor state. Is you know it's really the same thing. That sounds good. Thanks. Okay. Thanks. Uh, okay. I'm gonna move forward. <laughs> um, what are the results that we have? Well, you know, first just to understand. Uh, what the framework allows us to do. Let's see what we can solve. First, I give you uh, a tabular MDP, you know, a finite state and action space. What is the Oracle going to do here? Well, it can prescribe one uh, query in every state and action. You know, a query gives back exact feedback, so it gives back the full reward and transition function at that state and action. So having, you know, observing the reward and transition in every state and action pair, pair exactly identifies the MDP. And so you can do uh, you know, policy evaluation or policy optimization. There is no problem. And you need exactly uh, state, you know, the number of state uh, and action space, uh, number of queries to fully solve uh, the MDP. Uh, linear bandits, uh, still, we are lucky with batch reinforcement learning. Uh, the model would be that the reward function is linear. Again, feature extractor is known. Some theta star parameter is what you're looking for, what you want to identify. And if you observe the exact reward function, essentially any basis uh, for, uh, uh, let's say, RD, if uh, this thing is living in RD, any basis in, in RD is going to precisely identify the theta star parameter. If you have noise, uh, really the situation isn't much worse. There are optimal ways, uh, like design of experiment, to uh, identify the bandit instance. Unfortunately, whenever you move to MDPs, uh, things uh, get into trouble. So this is, uh, uh, you know, one of the two main results. Uh, the other one is the exponential separation that is in the next slide. And I'm going to try to parse it. We can find a family of very hard MDPs uh, such that for any data set, and here really you have the power of the Oracle. Remember, the Oracle is... Uh, like, it, it has the ability to prescribe any distribution it wants. So we can conclude for any data set that you can find. Uh, and once again, the data set really contains a lot of information because it has the full reward and transition function. Well, but if the data set has a support, you know, a number of distinct state and action pairs that is less than exponential, and exponential takes the form horizon to the D, uh, dimensionality of the feature, then every, um, uh, every batch algorithm must do badly on at least one MDP in the class. In particular, if you're trying to identify um, the best policy, then it will return you a policy that is doing pretty badly. In particular, there is a policy that has a, uh, you know, a wide gap uh, compared to uh, the optimal policy. This is, you know, with some probability, but the probability is pretty high. It's like 50%, right? And for the off-policy evaluation, uh, it gives you back an estimator for the target policy, such that uh, the estimator is pretty wrong uh, um, in the starting state. Uh, we, you know, we only require uh, the, uh, the batch algorithm to be accurate at the starting state, and also the starting state is given initially to both the batch algorithm and the oracle. And for neither problem, um, uh, like for either problem, the, the, this combination of uh, uh, Oracle and uh, batch algorithm, they really cannot solve the problem. Surprisingly, um, if you try to do things online, 
then things are pretty easy. In the sense that the same MDP class where the BATS algorithm fails to find anything with less than exponential queries, well, for the same MDP class, you can find an online algorithm, so something that is you know, constrained by the, dyna the, the dynamics. It has the same knowledge, so it knows the MDP class, right? Um, but this online algorithm can indeed find the optimal policy using uh, uh, very few episodes. And by episode, uh, like one episode is really uh, small. It's just one action at the starting state, and uh, that's it. So you can say it's D plus one queries if you want. And uh, a key thing is that uh, the strategy changes only once, meaning that uh, uh, this uh, online algorithm is going to do something, right? It looks at the feedback from the environment, and then it decides uh, uh, the last policy, the plus one here, it decides the last policy, and this last policy is very informative and is going to precisely identify the MDP class at the end. This is, uh, uh, is something not uh, unique to this work, I think, in the sense that uh, um, a moderate amount of adaptivity is normally enough to do very well. For example, uh, in linear bandits, uh, um, depending on whether the, the context uh, is adversarially chosen or stochastically chosen, you may need just uh, uh, D change changes of policy or for stochast stochastic context, just uh, uh, log log T. So single, ad you know, little ad adaptivity really um, gets you quite far uh, in the sense that <clears throat> it can solve some problem that you cannot solve if you do not modify your data collection strategy uh, after uh, acquiring some data. Uh, Before, and to, uh, there's, can I interrupt? There's a, sure. uh, yeah, I think that Yasin has a question. So I think there are two questions that worth clarifying now. So yes. Jing Li asked, uh, does the lower bound host for randomized algorithms? Uh, what do you mean by randomized? So the Oracle can choose a uh, randomized uh, state. No, the, the algor I, I think what Jane means is the algorithm itself can just toss some random coins and do something weird. Uh, there's no external randomness, like, because you don't have data randomness, right? So for example, my mm -hmm. algorithm is running SGD, I have some randomness in there. So, okay, so the only randomness, uh, it, you know, is happening in three points. Here, the strategy that selects that the, the Oracle selects, uh, but this doesn't really do anything because uh, the environment chooses uh, the MDP after the Oracle has made this decision. So the randomness there doesn't do anything. And then uh, the bus data set that really doesn't, I mean, is fully deterministic in the sense that once the state and actions are chosen, um, the, the reward and transitions, those are really functions. So there is no randomness here. The only possible randomness is in the batch algorithm when it returns an answer. An answer. It can, of course, random, randomize the answer. So if it is undecided between uh, you know, uh, a plus one value or a minus one value, you can flip a coin and, uh, and return a randomized answer. And you know, this is covered by, uh, by the framework, but it doesn't, really, it doesn't make things more complicated. OK. Uh, I think the other question, I think, which is uh, what Yasin uh, asked, which is also the confusion I had in mind, is that previously when you introduced the batch RL protocol, especially when you write this like, you know, a sequence of state action pairs, gives gives people the feeling that maybe the Oracle can adaptively choose later state action pairs, depending on the previous outcomes of RNP, right? And that's not the case, right? Because otherwise no. the Oracle can run an online algorithm and <laughs> exactly. hand that online data set to the so-called batch algorithm, which is gonna, just gonna run the last step of a fully online algorithm, right? That, th so, that's precisely the thing. So this distinction, right. like <laughs> the fact that uh, the, the Oracle is not allowed to see the feedback is precisely to distinguish uh, this procedure from uh, uh, from online learning, it's right? Exactly for that reason. Otherwise, there so, would, you know, yes. there wouldn't be any distinction, right? So, so the batch algorithm can only choose a sequence of state action pairs, like with the yes. eyes blind, like can, well, before seeing which specific MDP the nature chooses. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. Okay. let me let, let me add a point that uh, uh, you know here for simplicity we only speak about state and actions in the paper. Uh, 
there are two different mechanisms uh, for acquiring data. One is by selecting directly the state and action, another is uh, by choosing policies. In that case, the Oracle knows uh, the state and action that the policies are going to visit. And uh, surprisingly, if you're uh, free to choose just the policies, ju sorry, just the state and actions, uh, things are harder than uh, if the data set really originates uh, uh, from policies. And so in the paper, there is, you know, these perhaps more realistic settings where uh, really the data set is originating from uh, uh, policy rollouts. Okay. Yeah, so that's a good, uh, okay, so sorry, we shouldn't hold off you for the more, but I think that's a very interesting point because that's what exactly what I was thinking because if you allow the data to be collected from policies, you get, you, you actually get MVP dependent data distributions, mm -hmm. right? Because when you roll out the policy in the MVP, the state action pairs you visit will depend on the MVP dynamics. So yeah, presumably exactly. that's exactly. actually more helpful in some way. Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah, so yeah, we exactly. should let you exactly. continue to see the actual results. Uh, yeah. Actually, could so, I ask you one, one quick question, Andrew? Uh, I'm, yeah. I'm wondering is your result actually specific to the to the domain, like uh, the space your f f feature vector can span. For example, if your feature vector can span only in a uh, syntax, is your result still holds? Like, uh, I think your lower bound is kind of like saying if the query point SA is not, not adaptive to the MDP, then you suffer from something. But like, uh, for example, if the feature space is like syntax, and I just not adaptively query the Query the unit vector of each direction, like e e one, e two, to e d. That seems to work. Uh, that is okay, but that is uh, no wait. So well, it depends. Okay, if you have a simplex uh, and just a simplex, yes. But there you're implicitly leveraging. I, I mean, I have to see how you would like what you have in mind to construct this thing. But but what they understand, yeah, uh, uh, like yeah, you're leveraging some convexity there, and and you know it's it's a much easier problem. But but then if I give you something like uh, instead of a ball, I give you something in the one norm. So you know this uh, uh, rectangle in uh, in multiple dimension. I think mm -hmm. uh, things are still pretty hard there. So so I just wondering like by computing like g optimal design, those cover points would not work for no. some specific assumption. Like under some specific assumption of the domain set. Like you have to make extra assumptions. Yeah. Extra assumptions, yeah. yes. Yeah, you have to make extra assumptions. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. So w w what is your domain? Hey, sure. Can, can, we, can we actually let Andrew like talk about the construction for those who have not re read the paper yet before yeah, we yeah. go into so, these uh, discussions? I think the construction, you know, is going to clarify, you know, several things. Uh, and I'm going to get to it now. Uh, it precisely highlight uh, this... Uh, bootstrapping issue that I'm sure uh, uh, most of you have heard, uh, probably from Saturn and Barto, uh, but also from uh, uh, many other papers. Um, okay, you know, to understand what's going on, let's take a look at uh, why things work in bandits. So the all, uh, you know, presentation and, and, and uh, well, not presentation, but uh, um, explanation of the hardness uh, is just a couple of slides. Uh, this one, the next one. Uh, I want to introduce this one because I think uh, um, it, you know, it makes everyone familiar with the notation and and really highlights the distinction between bandits and uh, uh, MDPs. Okay, so suppose you are trying to solve a linear bandit problem and you have features in uh, RD, so R2 in this example. What would you do? Well, the oracle, uh, you know, for every sample that uh, the oracle prescribes. Uh, right, uh, you're going to observe the reward uh, function, which is exactly linear. So if you have multiple samples, what you would do is, uh, uh, you know, write down uh, all these uh, linearity equation where the reward uh, follows a linear function and try to solve this system of linear equation, for example. So compactly, uh, you have this uh, phi, theta equal to r, you're gonna solve it uh, uh, if you're just using, uh, you know, uh, and features, uh, these uh, covariance matrix, uh, uh, like if you're choosing them properly, like uh, an, in an orthogonal way, for example, what the design of experiment is doing, uh, as Gene is suggesting, um, you, like, th this covariance matrix is going to be invertible, 
and so there is no problem. And once again, the blue features, which have those ones, uh, are chosen by the Oracle. So you have flexibility uh, in choosing those features. But in RL, uh, things go wrong. Uh, why do they go wrong? Well, because of bootstrapping. So say that you observe one sample, and you want to write down the Bellman equation. The Bellman equation would be action value function, right? Equal reward plus uh, uh, discounted expected next value function. And here I'm already using the uh, value function representation that we know holds true, right? And the bootstrapping uh, that you find, for example, in Saturn and Barton is really this term here. And the meaning is really that you're trying to estimate the value uh, of the value function or more compactly this parameter theta by using the parameter theta itself. So what happens if you have many samples? Well, I'm gonna do as before, uh, write uh, um, a linear system to solve them. Your algorithm may be doing something completely different, but really this is a statement about uh, the Bellman equations. <clears throat> so what you're going to do is you have a nonce, uh, this theta parameter, and we're gonna put them on the right hand side. And the matrix uh, that multiplies your unknown parameter, it really contains a couple of things. One thing that you can choose, uh, this blue vector is something that the Oracle has chosen. So the Oracle has chosen a very good uh, uh, set of features, but then the environment has given me an MDP where the discounted next state expected feature uh, might be acting pretty adversarially. Uh, this, uh, you know, feature uh, V plus, uh, it depends uh, on the transition dynamics that are chosen by the environment. It depends on the target policy. Or if you're doing uh, best policy identification, there is going to be a max here. So this is actually nonlinear, but uh, uh, for simplicity, let's consider the off policy valuation case uh, in which uh, uh, this bootstrapping term is really linear. So what's the problem? Well, the problem is this. Uh, the Oracle uh, did uh, its best work. Uh, it is still working uh, with the same feature space, uh, uh, with the same feature domain as the bandits. So it is in RD. It chooses orthogonal features, right, to maximize uh, um, the quality of the data set. But then somehow the environment uh, chooses uh, some discounted next state feature that are going to undo the learning that the BATS algorithm or the Oracle wanted to do along the x-axis. So in particular, um, those next state features are chosen parallel to the x-axis in this specific example. <laughs> and the outcome is uh, that the, the effective features, if you want to call them this way, that populate these uh, uh, matrix uh, are really all parallel and they're really, you know, all parallel to the y axis. What it means uh, is that uh, this matrix up here, unfortunately, it is rank deficient. Uh, the construction in, in the paper ensures realizability, so it ensures that there exists at least one solution. But unfortunately, if this matrix is rank deficient because rows are parallel, then it really means you can find many solutions. And uh, you might wonder, uh, like, isn't this, uh, uh, maybe if you try to solve the problem in a different way, uh, things are better. But really, this is a statement about the Bellman equation. So the, what I wrote up here for a single sample is really the Bellman equation at a given state and action pair. So what I wrote down here for many samples are really the Bellman equations locally are the state and actions that are in the data set. And the uh, V transpose theta is really the action value function. So what this means uh, is that uh, the action value functions uh, that uh, can solve this problem, well, there are infinitely many. So in particular, uh, you have infinitely many uh, action value functions that correspond to uh, different MDPs that could have generated the reward and the transitions that the agent has received. And all these action value functions, they solve the uh, Bellman equation locally. 
Feynman equation, they still have a unique solution over the full domain, but over most of the domain, they admit uh, multiple solutions. I want to spend one slide and compare uh, the, what happens in bandits and in MDPs. In bandits, to recap, the Oracle can pick the features, right? And uh, it can ensure that this uh, matrix is fully invertible. Uh, I mean, this is going to be tall and skinny, right? So typically you're going to solve it uh, with least square, but at least it's going to be full rank. Whereas uh, in Marco decision processes, uh, uh, the Oracle only can only select uh, a piece of the matrix here and the environment can pick uh, another piece that goes into the matrix. But unfortunately, it can pick uh, the next state feature by choosing the dynamics in a way that uh, uh, is going to undo the learning along uh, um, one axis. And so how would you solve uh, uh, an MDP class like this, if you were to use Bansorel, well, we know the key is uh, this matrix right now. We want to make this full rank. We already saw that uh, uh, if you're working, for example, RD, and you use D features, D, D feature vectors, the environment can uh, uh, act adversarially. So what if we use more of them? Unfortunately, you can try to add more, but the problem still persists. Um, for you know, pretty much the same reason. Uh, when can things, to, uh, when will things uh, go right? Well, if you take a look at the properties, uh, at, you know, the properties of this construction, uh, what the next state feature is, is trying to do, well, they are all parallel to the x-axis. So they are trying to erase what the uh, agent is trying to learn along the x-axis, right? <laughs> but uh, they have, uh, you know, there is a limit to the power of the environment because the next state feature is discounted, which means uh, it's going to be slightly shorter than uh, the features, uh, the feature vectors that the Oracle can choose. So in particular, all these, uh, 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 you know, bootstrapped next state features are acting adversarially, but they are slightly, like they're a bit uh, um, smaller, like less longer than the feature that are selected by the Oracle and they all go in the x-axis direction. And so if you try to probe something really in the direction of the x-axis, the environment will not be able to screw up the uh, batch algorithm and the Oracle. So you really need to identify this uh, spherical cap. And the construction, the way it works, uh, is that this spherical cap, it can really be anywhere. And so the batch algorithm has to do uh, a lot of work to identify uh, the spherical cap. In particular, once you get to a situation like this, so once you add a feature uh, like this in this spherical cap, the matrix in question becomes full rank, and you have everything at your disposal to solve uh, the, the system of linear equation and to identify, uh, for example, the optimal policy or the target uh, action value function. Comparison with the uh, online RL, well, uh, batch data set, uh, really every MDP in the class <clears throat> has a different, uh, <clears throat> has a different uh, hyperspherical cap. So imagine the construction of before, but it can get rotated um, for different MDPs in the class. And uh, I think, you know, the picture is in 2D, so uh, it doesn't give it just, it doesn't do justice to this process. Uh, but uh, if you go to RN uh, or let's say RD, uh, you know, there is a lot of space in RD and most of the space uh, in the sphere is really around the boundary, which means uh, you are going to be able to find exponentially many um, hyperspherical caps. Uh, and like the height of this hyperspherical cap is precisely this uh, uh, one minus gamma and there are you know, exponentially many of these. What happens in, uh, in online RL though, in, for an online algorithm? Well, what an online algorithm can do is precisely this. So it can get few, you know, directions. Uh, and uh, what uh, it is going to receive, uh, is going to receive these next state features. And so it can detect that things are, are pretty bad. Like the, the environment is trying to act uh, adversarially 
um, with respect to the overcall and bad algorithm. And remember, those uh, next state features, they really go in the same direction, right? Uh, having experienced these next state features, the online algorithm can understand uh, that uh, uh, it has to acquire information from uh, one of the you know, two hyperspherical caps, that are two that are uh, symmetric uh, in general, and it just needs to, to probe what's inside the hyperspherical cap. It is going to make uh, these uh, metrics, these key metrics, uh, full rank, and once it is full rank, uh, things are pretty good. Before I proceed, is there any question? So uh, I guess, yeah, we have some questions, but some of them can be put to the end. I think there's a question of uh, whether this applies to fixed horizon setting. It does not seem to, I believe. Uh, not in this way. No. Not in this protocol, right? So that's what I'm no. thinking. Like, because if you give the full transition distribution, can I just run the bandit algorithm bottom up? Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Right. So, so then yeah. I will just fully solve it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So okay, if you want to do a finite horizon, as you're saying, uh, uh, like you know, the last layer is a bandit. Uh, the framework here is super stronger. You observe the exact reward and transitions, and you know, you, you can identify uh, Q star precisely or Q pi precisely, and then you keep doing the same problem over and over and over. Um, the problem with uh, uh, discounted, uh, you know, infinite horizon array is that you don't have a starting point. Like you, you don't have a starting point where you know the solution, and uh, like you can of course try multiple ones, like you know, exponentially many, and try to run your value iteration. But but then uh, uh, you're gonna have multiple of these starting points that are going to converge and you don't know like multiple of these are going to be fixed point locally for the local bandwidth like, equations but you don't know which one is true uh, so something like this cannot arise in finite horizon but let me also add some you know more practical comment uh, that you're really pushing the, the finite horizon here because uh, you're assuming no specification you're assuming no noise you're assuming nothing uh, in practice you always have, you know, your approximator is never exact. You have some noise. Even if the problem is perfectly linear, at least you have a round of errors uh, in your algorithm. So things, you know, can still go uh, pretty badly. Okay, if there is nothing else, I am going to continue. Um, so I think we have two mechanisms uh, right now that uh, are introducing some issues. Uh, one is uh, uh, extrapolation, and there are you know two other papers uh, uh, right before this, uh, and I'm going to you know discuss this uh, uh, in a little more detail in the literature. Uh, but but those are really you know two different mechanisms that can induce hardness. Uh, why is that? Well, because extrapolation. Uh, you can potentially mitigate that uh, with more samples. Well, I mean, it depends what you're trying to do. If it is extrapolation of the approximation error, uh, it can really be bad because, you know, approximation error, you cannot really um, reduce it, right? But if you're extrapolating noise, uh, you can still put more samples and solve the thing. You might need exponentially many samples, but eventually you're going to be able to uh, give back an accurate answer. And in this case, uh, uh, we know that, uh, for example, G-optimal experimental design is pretty good. Like you can do that with uh, least square value iteration um, or least square policy evaluation. And it is, in a sense, going to give you a fairly good answer. There is still a gap, um, uh, like, uh, you know, is it exponential in the horizon or exponential in the dimension? It should be exponential in the dimension, right? But still, it's going to give you something sensible. But uh, uh, here, uh, if you have bootstrapping in infinite horizon, things are really bad because, really, we are working in the limit of infinite data. Like, we observe the exact reward and transition functions here. And so, like, by definition, it's not that you can add more samples and, and solve the thing. And in particular, G-optimal design here does really, really badly because uh, 
there is a you know an important result that uh, G optimal design uh, is prescribing whatever order of D square uh, feature vectors, but the statement of the lower bound is really about the support of the distribution because we experience infinite data, and really uh, what has to grow here is. Uh, the support of the sampling distribution. So G optimal experiment, experimental design in those instances, uh, it, it is not going to help you. And uh, I mean, question, do we expect uh, those issues uh, uh, to arise in practice? Uh, uh, I'm sure, you know, we can debate this for longer. Uh, you're going to have different uh, uh, opinions about this. Uh, my answer would be yes. Uh, because we are really putting a lot of assumptions here that help the learner. Uh, you know, it's easy to, to imagine what happens if, uh, uh, you know, the data set is bad, what happens if uh, there is correlation in the data set, what happens if there is bias, uh, if you have approximation error. And this example is also not really very brittle in the sense that uh, what happens if you do a perturbation of this construction and really the next state feature is not creating these, uh, uh, um, you know, effective features that are along the y-axis. Well, you can imagine these metrics is, is going to be almost rank deficient, and there are ways to measure it, right? Uh, but almost rank deficient means uh, e-conditioning, and we know e-conditioning is equivalent to uh, doing error amplification uh, of whatever you have on the right-hand side. And this is something that we observe in practice, uh, uh, that algorithms, uh, uh, they tend to have problems. And uh, I mean, yeah, bootstrapping is something um, pretty well known. Uh, even in Saturn and Barto, uh, the deadly triad, uh, you know, it's a key, um, it's a key uh, element of the deadly triad. Literature, uh, I'm only able to touch this really quickly, uh, and only about lower bounds. Uh, there are, you know, a number of papers that they want to recommend that are uh, in similar spirit as this one. Um, one is from uh, uh, Simon about. Uh, Misspecification, what happens if you have misspecification? Well, there is a mandatory uh, factor that, that you have to pick up in uh, reinforcement learning versus, statist um, versus machine learning, right? Uh, and the main technique uh, um, is still, in a sense, extrapolation, and it really builds on the Johnson Linda Strauss uh, uh, lemma. There is a lot of space in, uh, in high dimension. And moving more closely to, to this work, uh, um, that is uh, the work by, by Chaba um, about, uh, you know, for online algorithm, you really need to pay uh, an exponential price. You need to have exponentially many uh, samples uh, in the linear case, right? And the main technique there is extrapolation. Extrapolation is um, what is being used in another paper for offline reinforcement learning by uh, Ruzong Wong, uh, the Foster and Sham. Uh, and uh, they look at a very similar problem in the finite horizon setting, right? Um, I think the takeaway from uh, uh, that work is that uh, having uh, a covariance matrix uh, uh, that looks good, uh, you know, if it looks uh, uh, well conditioned, unfortunately, that's not enough. Um, and why is it not enough? Because uh, the example that they have there in, in the paper is really a... Um, you know, a, uh, an MDP with a small state in action space. And we do know that uh, um, if you have a tabular MDP, then, you know, it's simple to find a good distribution, just uh, sample uniformly in every state in action pair. And so the takeaway is that uh, looking at the covariance matrix uh, is not really a good test uh, uh, to see, to assess the quality of the data set in reinforcement learning. And I think, like, this work really reinforces that. Uh, you know, it goes one step further and it says, uh, uh, really, you cannot find uh, any distribution. Like, there, there exist hard MDP classes where you cannot find any distribution um, in a slightly different setting. This is, you know, infinite horizon versus finite horizon. And the mechanism that is inducing the hardness is quite different, I would say. I mean, of course, you can solve an infinite horizon MDP using um, finite horizon algorithms, and you're going to see extrapolation. But really, the core issue is bootstrapping, which is inherent to the Bellman equation. And then there is this exponential separation to uh, online RL. OK, last slide to conclude. What have we learned? Um, batch reinforcement learning in a model-free way can be very, very hard. Uh, even if you have a 
like theoretically like the best possible data set, right? Appropriately defined. We understand a bit more why uh, like the role that bootstrapping plays uh, versus extrapolation. And we understand that in some problems, extrapolation might be key to give a sample efficient array. Uh, but the good news maybe is uh, um, this exploration is, I mean, you might not need to do much in the sense that uh, little adaptivity uh, can get you pretty far uh, in the sense that for these specific examples, uh, uh, just changing the, the data acquisition strategy once in the middle of the data collection process allows you to fully solve the problem. Uh, and, and like the result is, I would say, more general. Like we see similar things, for example, in uh, stochastic linear bandits. If the context is uh, stochastically chosen, you only need log-log policy changes. And if it is uh, adversarially chosen, you need uh, something like uh, D log N uh, policy changes. So it looks like, uh, you know, um, there are limitations to Bacherelle, but if you allow uh, to change the strategy just a little bit, then uh, uh, things uh, get uh, much better. And uh, I think this is everything. And so I want to thank you for your attention. Thank you. So Andrea, I have a, a question. Since you didn't mention the your positive results for the online setting, I, I'm curious because in your protocol, you give the learner a very strong power, right? Essentially for every state action pair, you get infinite data. So mm -hmm. that makes your lower bound very strong, but yeah. uh, it could oh. possibly compromise the upper bound, right? Oh so, yeah, so the, you're, you're definitely right on that. Uh, somehow I wanted to level the playing field. Uh, so let me think. Uh, um, I guess maybe let me ask more explicitly for others yeah. to get is like for this contrast, like you contrast the lower bound with the upper bound that the online algorithm only needs the plus one episodes. But what if the online algorithm can only has the, you know, the, the standard uh, uh, interaction protocol where you like roll out the trajectories instead of actually seeing the um, the, the 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 true transition probabilities along the way. Uh, it's still gonna be okay because uh, uh, for this specific problem, of course, uh, it's still gon going to be okay because uh, uh, I mean you just need uh, uh, you know one divided by epsilon square samples uh, to return something epsilon accurate, uh, and so like it doesn't worsen the problem significantly. Um, so yeah, it, it's it's still okay. Actually, let me make another comment. Um, uh, that I have several settings in, in, in the paper, you know, depending on the data acquisition process. And uh, if the Oracle is choosing really the state and action pairs, you can uh, make the assumptions even stronger. And you can say the action value function of every policy is uh, uh, linearly representable. And in that case, the same result holds. And for online learning, um, we have something, or at least in the optimization setting, we have something pretty general. Um, for example, you know, policy iteration. If you start with uh, uh, a good uh, covariance matrix, always works under those assumptions. So this is something, you know, in addition. Oh. Yeah. Um, yeah, so uh, also I see some hands up. So. Uh, should we also, um, you should also go through some of the earlier questions that didn't get uh, answered. Uh -huh. um, uh, so, Geller, you have a question about uh, blow up. Do you want to ask it now? Uh, yeah, to... yeah. So, um, yep. so, yeah, the question was just like, would this construction work if you had a, an L2 bound on the features that doesn't scale exponentially? Like, it's not like, uh, one over gamma to some power. Uh, let me understand. So the features here are uh, uh, of norm one, all of them. Oh, okay. So, um, sure. So even the next state features are norm one. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So the feature space okay. is exactly okay. this. So it's a ball. Uh, it's you know the the Euclidean unit ball. So uh, norm of phi less than one in in two norm. 
Okay, cool. Thank you. I, I think, you know, you could put even uh, uh, one arm. I don't, yeah, I think uh, it's going to be okay. You will need to change the construction, but uh, I think you're going to run into troubles anywhere because, anyway, because you will need to test all vertices and, you know, there are exponentially many. So there are also some hands up. So Alex, uh, do you want to ask your question? Um, yeah, so I guess, first of all, thank you very much for the talk. Uh, very interesting ideas. Um, from a practical perspective, I think there's kind of two ways that one can think, of, think about sort of some of these issues that are raised, which is one of them um, is uh, I should allow for some adaptivity in my algorithms so that I can actually take advantage of the online sort of power. But on the other viewpoint, one can ask, uh, well, is there any way to restrict the class of MDPs that I work with in some kind of practically understandable way so that an example of this type doesn't happen? So I'm just curious, like, how general do you think these ideas are? Uh, and, like, do they survive if you restrict the class of MDPs in an appropriate way? And if you can restrict the class of MDPs, sort of, is that something that a practitioner could kind of practically understand how to do? Yeah, okay, so first question, uh, um, oh gosh, first question was, uh, um, what was the first question? So the first question was, I guess, basically, um, does this issue still hold if you sort of restrict the MDP in an appropriate oh, sense? Yeah, Can you I restrict the, the class of MDPs yeah, to get rid so of this? So yeah, I think this was the second one, but uh, basically, yes, absolutely. There is a, a huge literature out there uh, about uh, what you really need. I mean, what, what are sufficient conditions for you to learn about things? Uh, I think in the last year, for example, this uh, low rank transition model has become very popular, uh, but you know, there are many other things. In general, uh, model-based RL, at least from my understanding, uh, is much easier. Uh, those things, uh, uh, they don't tend to pop up. Eh? And actually, you know, there is a result from uh, Wenstein, I think, a few years back about, you know, these exponential separations. So, uh, practically, I really think, you know, this problem is important in the sense that uh, we have these super negative results, eh? but we shouldn't be scared of that uh, in the sense that we know that often uh, reinforcement learning is also very successful. And so, for example, uh, um, even without looking at all the assumptions that are there in the literature, uh, what happens if, you know, there is uh, completeness uh, uh, and all these things, uh, I can tell you, like, really the geometry here is pretty bad. Um, and you're not going to find a, a sphere uh, with those uh, uh, next state feature in your garden. And, uh, uh, you know, likewise for trees, uh, uh, you might find a tree in your garden, I mean, but uh, those things are not common in the real world. Uh, so, you know, just in terms of, you know, without adding any uh, crazy assumption, I imagine that for more reasonable uh, uh, geometries, right? Uh, what happens if, uh, you know, your features, they have, uh, uh, they are located in, in a special way in the space. Uh, uh, you might be able to get much farther uh, than this. So, yeah, definitely, um, you know, common problems, they normally have a ton of additional structure. And uh, we don't exactly know uh, what are, you know, the good structures from a geometrical perspective or from a more abstract uh, uh, assumption perspective. We don't exactly know what those, uh, uh, what those good conditions really are. Okay, so uh, I Thank think you very are, yeah. So we're sorry, so someone else uh, raised before you. So, uh, Mayang, do you want to ask first? Yep, uh, thanks, man. Uh, uh, so I had a query uh, with respect to the uh, 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 hypersphere here. So I uh, uh, wanted to ask what will happen in the case of um, um, lonely caps and uh, versus those, uh, if those caps are uh, overlapped in uh, some way. So uh, will that have an effect on the uh, problem uh, that we're trying to solve or those accuracies will um, differ? Uh, let me understand. So, okay, you're talking about the spherical caps here. Yes. Uh, what what happens if they overlap? Mm -hmm. 
uh, so okay, CAPS um, is really um, like for every cap, there is one MDP, or actually two of them, really. So when I uh, write a picture like this, uh, it really means uh, there is one MDP, and uh, like the associated cap is somewhere, but the agent doesn't know where it is. And uh, so if you're saying those things are overlapping, uh, it really means you're adding MDPs uh, to the MDP class the way I understand it. And, and so yeah, like you're making the problem even, you know, more, more complicated. Uh, but, but I'm not sure if this was the intent of the question. Uh, but, uh, 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 but, but I was thinking with respect to then uh, those um, um, distributions will be crowded. So uh, uh, sampling that particular trajectory will uh, have an effect uh, there. If you think from the um, uh, formulation that you just uh, um, put here. So, yeah, so, okay, so, uh, okay, so suppose uh, you happen to be uh, sampling something that ends up in this spherical cup. Uh, mm -hmm. Your question is what happens if uh, uh, there is some other spherical cup uh, that is partially overlapping with this guy, right? Uh, will I get uh, information about it in this specific example? Uh, the answer is yes, if your uh, sample feature is also in this other spherical cap. So, mm. you know, uh, if your feature is being covered by, let's say, five hyperspherical caps, uh, then uh, you do acquire information uh, if the MDP is one of these five. Absolutely. 